Gators Breakdown. Because there's never a dull moment in Gator Nation. The Gators Breakdown Podcast is ready to go. I'm your host, David Waters, and you can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SEC. And joining me on this episode is Corey Bender from Gators Territory on the Rivals Network. Corey, my friend, I think you had a, uh, a busy weekend. Yes, sir. I definitely did, Dave. Yeah, we had the Orlando Rivals camp. We had the one in Miami the weekend prior. I wasn't able to attend that one. But, no, definitely it was an eventful weekend in Orlando. A lot of top Gators targets. And uh, obviously a Florida commit there in attendance, too. So there's definitely a lot to look out for. Yep. Uh, Corey, uh, quickly, before we get into and, and move forward, uh, we'll talk more about this later on in the episode, but your quick initial thoughts of the uh, of the recruiting class the Gators just had 2020, just finished it up a couple weeks ago. Uh, what's your quick initial thought of the 2020 uh, of that 2020 class for the Gators? I think it was a huge success. I know a lot of people always kind of pinpoint as far as how Florida closed on the two sign days itself. I know in the first one they wanted Danelle Harris. Um, they obviously want some other guys there, too. And then obviously the one for this past few weeks ago was Avante Williams. But when you dissect the whole class from top to bottom, I think it was a huge success. I think, you know, just getting Josh Braun, that wasn't a, that was a prospect early on. We thought Florida had a chance, but it kind of fell in the Florida's lap once Pittman went to Arkansas. And just getting guys like that and then also in the transfer portal with Lorenzo Lingard, I think it kind of obviously makes that class even better and makes some of those recent misses not as significant. Even with Florida at safety, safety is one of the, the main positions Florida wanted to fill and kind of add some depth to. I'm still pretty pleased with that haul, the haul they brought in. Um, as far as Mordecai McDaniel, he's going to be – he's more of the raw prospect of the bunch. Um, like I said, he has a lot of work to do, a special teams ace, but – all the other guys, they sent a lot of quality players and in the trenches. They did good as well. They got Princely out of Texas, who was a good addition. Florida really wanted to sign a strong side defensive end in this class. And the remaining guys they signed were all mostly interior guys. So they kind of sold them on that, saying, we don't have many true strong side DNs on the roster now, especially in this class. So you add him, he's another four-star prospect. I think Florida filled a lot of needs, but they also did a really good job in the trenches. And as people always say, that's where you win football games. Absolutely. The SEC, that's exactly what I say. You know, the, the Gators hit their knee quarterback in the trenches, uh, f- uh, filling in the secondary as well. But uh, as Corey mentioned, he was in Orlando this past weekend for the Rivals camp there. So we'll pick his brain about all of that here, you know, on Gators breakdown, all football, all the time here. And Corey, uh, of course, you know, a, a lot of happenings there. But before we get to it all, remember, you can find Gators breakdown on news jackscom slash Gators breakdown. You'll find all the Gators break, breakdown episodes there, as well as News 4 Jack's coverage of the Gators. Uh, if you've missed uh, going back to our signing day episode, uh, more talk on Tim Brewster in the last couple of weeks, you go back and check all the past episodes of Gators Breakdown out there and all on all the popular podcast platforms as well. Um, and follow Gators Breakdown on Twitter and Facebook at Gators Breakdown. So, all right, Corey, let's start off with that event in Orlando this past weekend. The Rivals Camp Orlando showcased a lot of talent. Before we get into the headlines of the event, you know, give our listeners an idea of what goes on at a camp like this where there's so many prospects and, and, and how does it help these recruits? Yeah, I think overall, I mean, you have a lot of the big name guys, but I think with Rivals, they do a good job. They have a combine the day prior where it's a lot of the guys who aren't invited to the actual three strike camp. You know, the one, it's not three strike anymore, but the camp as far as the Rivals combine. Um, Rivals does a good job of kind of getting all different phases of kids. So you have the five star kids. You had Trevante Rucker, you know, one of Florida's wide receiver commits, but then you have guys that don't have any offers at all. And in years past, you'll see a lot of these kids win MVP and they might have one offer for, for say, you know, Charleston Southern. And a lot of these schools still kind of keep tabs on rivals and a lot of the, uh, the content they push out when it comes to evals because a lot of it's free. It's out there for a lot of schools to kind of dissect. And we also do a good job of you know doing a lot of different, um, you know, as far as videotaping everything and getting a lot of the drills filmed too. So you'll see a lot of kids in the coming weeks that maybe you didn't know much about entering the event. You'll see a lot of them start to add a few offers here and there. And, and that's a good part of rivals. It's not all about the guys who get invited to the five-star challenge. Um, it's about getting all the guys exposures. If you come out and compete, especially the day before at the other combine, you'll get an invite to the actual camp and you get to compete against some of the best guys. And that's all documented out there. So I think it gets all the best guys, all the household names. You get to learn more about them as far as what their true strengths are. I think we all get accustomed to, we've seen these guys on social media and you, you really don't get to eye these guys too much unless you see them in person. So 
it's a good eval tool for us, but at the same time, it gives exposure um, to all those kids that maybe are kind of looking for that next step in the recruitment. And in years past, it's kind of um, kind of proves to that that you know this camp is really a success for everyone involved. All right, let's get into some of the participants of the camp, and let's start with the Gators' most recent commit. You already mentioned him, wide receiver Trevante Rucker. What did he show and do so well that earned him an invite to the Rivals Five Star Challenge? Yeah, he's not the biggest receiver, but he does a great job of extending out and does it has a really nice catch radius for a small receiver. Um, at the top of his routes, really does a good job of breaking defenders off. Um, really showcases a nice double move. I think many saw him on social media on Sunday uh, where he did a hook and go and got basically caught up the DB and really got him off balance and then took it to the house um, and really extended out for that football as well. It wasn't the easiest catch. Um, and that was actually from John Hevesy's son, who was playing quarterback on that play, which is funny to know. Um, mm-hmm. But no, he, he's, he's one of those kids, man, you get him one-on-one coverage. Um, you really have to be disciplined when guarding him. He'll, he's one of those kids, he's one of those kids that can really make a, de- a defensive back look silly if they're not really operating with the proper technique, just based off the kid's footwork and the way he just sets up defenders. So um, not the biggest kid, more of a true slot, but also does a good job of really extending out and catching away from his body um, and getting vertical too. So he plays much bigger than his size, and he also has a, a looseness and that quickness to go with it, which explains why he's such a highly regarded receiver. Corey, I'm glad you brought that up. Do you think this was somebody in particular the staff really focused in on? Because we know the history and we know the recruiting, recent recruiting history of getting those you know big bodied receivers that Mullen and, and, and um, Billy Gonzalez are kind of known for. Do you think they needed a, a, to go target a different type of receiver and getting one like Rucker? Yeah, it's a good little blend. You can't have all. Like, exactly. I mean, like you said, last year's class, I mean, Leonard Manuel, we still have to see what he's going to do, but he's a bigger receiver. You got Frazier's, you got Henderson, a lot of big body targets um, out there in the perimeter. And you need to kind of have those different varieties out there. And with him, and, and the thing is with Rucker, too, like I said, he's more of a traditional slot. Um, he can kind of go deep. He can do a lot of intermediate routes. But um, he, like I said before, he plays a lot bigger than his size. So he might not be the biggest receiver out there, uh, but he'll go up and get it. And uh, he also has the top end speed to really, you know, take it to the house and really, you know, have those big lengthy plays out there. But um, I think with him, like I said, he, Florida was so familiar with him early on the process, uh, early on the process, considering he was already committed. Mm-hmm. Um, it was one of those prospects you really can't cool on. You know how close you are to getting him back in the fold. You know, Florida is persistent. They never backed off. And now he's in the class again. And um, I'd be surprised if he kind of if he ever reopened it unless it was something drastic. Um, but, you know, you could tell all along, even though he wasn't committed uh, during that portion between his first commitment. And now you could tell that Florida uh, was definitely still the, you know, the leader in the clubhouse. And he just needed a few months to really kind of have everything settled down and finalized before making that decision again. All right, so that was the one commit that was there for the Gators, but plenty, plenty of targets there, Corey, for the Gators that were in Orlando. You know, not only targets, but high-profile uh, elite targets for the Gators. Desmond Watson, Bryce Langston. I uh, hope I'm saying this right. Tunsume Adelier. Is that, is that yeah, right? Okay, good, there, yeah. there we go. Uh, Michael Morris. You know, a, a lot of big targets in the trenches here for, for the Gators. So what did these, what that group of guys do that, that separated themselves there? Yeah, I mean, a lot of those guys will be on campus on March 7th, too. Um, like I said, we'll get into that later. But, yeah, Desmond Watson, he's a guy, obviously, a, a massive kid over at Powerhouse Armwood High School. He has to drop a little bit of weight, and he actually mentioned that to me, that that's his biggest priority right now is dropping some weight. Uh, but he really kind of fits that role as far as over the center at nose tackle. Um, like I said, has to refine his technique. And like I said, once Nick Savage – um, gets a hold of this kid. He could become a big time player, but he's just one of those kids that's just very hard to contain. And um, like I said, just a massive presence. And I think Florida is definitely trending there. Um, obviously, to me, obviously over at IMG Academy, Florida's really picked up the pursuit with him. I mean, Florida was involved um, last year as well. Um, he obviously has family all throughout Florida. Now that he's living in Florida, IMG Academy, it makes it much easier to visit campus. And um, he was on, yeah, he was there for the first junior day on February 1st. Um, Florida knocked out of the park with him and, you know, he came to our camp um, with the Florida wristband, really showing Florida a lot of love. And when I spoke to him, he said Florida's a school recruiting him and it's not recruiting him the hardest. And it's not even close. He said at least every staff member, which is obviously it's probably not every coach, obviously, but he said every staff member reaches out to him at least three times a day. And I was like, wow, that really says something as far as how much of a priority is. Um, you know, there still has to do a little bit of work there. It's early. Yeah, I mean, it's a good, but as far as the vibe right now, there's a lot of momentum for Florida. Um, and you mentioned, too, Bryce Langston, who's obviously a teammate of uh, Trevante Rucker. His his recruitment is pretty, pretty much pretty similar to what Trevante was going through. Langston, he, he's pretty well-reserved, doesn't really reveal a whole lot, but 
Um, you know, Ford is definitely the leader there as far as, you know, if he was going to decide today, I'd be shocked if it wasn't Florida. Um, you know, he mentioned taking an official visit to LSU when we spoke to him recently as well. But, you know, he told me for, on Sunday, you know, Florida's the staff he has the best relationship with. Um, he, he, he mentioned dragging his recruitment out. Um, I don't know how long, I don't know how serious he was when he mentioned that. It wouldn't shock me if he, you know, announces sooner than later. Um, but I definitely think Florida's sitting in a great spot there. And, um, the list goes on and on, man. And one other one I'll list too is uh, Jaheem Singletary. He's a 2022 safety. Um, he's a future Rivals 100 guy. He'll be a top 100 prospect for us here in the future uh, for the 2022 class. He told us as well that, you know, Florida will be very difficult to beat in his recruitment. And he would be a massive get. I know it's obviously early and you look at 2022, it's, not, I'm not going to say it's not hard to get excited about, but it's pretty early there. But he's an elite prospect, and he wants to decide either before spring football or right after. So um, a lot of these kids, like I said, trending towards Florida. Um, like I said, a lot of big-name kids as well, and we just got to let everything play out. And um, as long as the staff continues to do what they're doing, you know, I think it's going to be good results. Yeah, you know, let's take a look at two guys that the Gators are hoping – you know, they could be lining up against each other in future Gator practices. And Singletary is one of those guys. You just brought him up. But wide receiver Mario Williams as well. Yep. Uh, you know, two targets right there that kind of held their own there. Yeah, Mario Williams too, man. And um, early on in the process, he he was kind of vocal about he, he was hoping to leave Florida uh, for college. And, you know, Dan Mullen, his coach told us on Sunday that Dan Mullen – himself calls Mario every day and makes sure to make contact with him. And, uh, you know, he's obviously a top, top priority for the staff. And, you know, as of right now, it's kind of tough to tell, you know, he'll be on campus. He told us that he's, um, you know, eyeing an official visit to Florida for the LSU game. Um, I know LSU is a school he loved growing up as well. So I think that's an opportunity to really get a, really get a view of both schools, you know, and to really kind of compare them. Um, but like I said, early on, he was mentioning about leaving the state of Florida. I think he's more open to kind of staying put, you know, as far as months went by. Um, he told – when I talked to him at the Future 50 Media Day in December, he said if he did stay in Florida, you know, the Florida, University of Florida would be the choice. It's just about, you know, how, how serious is that? You know, I mean, he's going to take his official visits. Florida's definitely on that short list for him. Um, it's just going to come down to that gut feel. He's going to take some visits, and we'll see at the end of the year where Florida kind of fits in the picture as far as proximity and, you know, what really is, the, you know, the top priority for him. Yeah, Singletary, you know, 2022 guy, as you say, you know, from here in Jacksonville. So uh, one guy I can keep an eye on. <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> uh, because it, believe me, uh, the, the word around town here is, yeah, that, that is one to watch out for. There's a lot of Gator um, positive stuff if you follow him on you know, on Twitter and and listen to him talking from people that know him. So you know, one uh, the Gators, you know, need to keep their tabs on. But uh, as you said, from this far out, as you said, it's too hard to get excited for. But the Gators in good shape there. So you know, when these events are over and done with, you get to talk to a lot of these prospects. So which ones are the Gators really, like, really standing out for uh, with these prospects? Then you know, and, and what you want to see, uh, the Gators are battling you know, a lot of the nation's best programs for a lot of these top targets. Yeah. And one kid I'll start with just because I didn't mention him at first was Marcus Burke out of Trinity Christian. He's another one we spoke with. Um, you know, Florida has been telling me, we want you to be a Gator. You know, we want to be, want you to be Gary, you know, Torian Gray speaking to him. I think it's three or four coaches that have been recruiting him. Um, it's going to come down. Florida and Georgia are his top two schools. He told yep. me initially that Georgia was a school recruiting the hardest, but now it's Florida. Um, it's going to be interesting because both schools have a pretty lengthy list. Um, as far as their wide receiver board. So it's going to be who who's kind of the bigger priority down the stretch. It's still pretty early. Florida's in a good spot with Rucker already in the class. You know, Brayshard Smith is kind of a versatile do-it-all type where I love his ability to catch the ball in the slot. I'm really intrigued by him, but he also can obviously um, lap in the backfield. Um, so he's going to be one to keep an eye on. But also, too, like I said, Bryce Langston, I think Florida's definitely the leader there. If he was to pick today, that would be my choice for sure. Um, Mario Williams, you know, it's kind of early with him, like we were talking about before. It's just you got to let things play out, and hopefully he kind of has that change of heart as far as – I won't say change of heart, but really warming up to staying in the Sunshine State. Um, and another one, too, I'll mention, too, is, um, you know, Jamie Felix. He's a 2022 running back out of Georgia. Um, a lengthy offer sheet, you know, Florida's been in on him since – I think the end of his freshman year, it's been a while. And, you know, even last year, he used to tell me Florida was the leader. Um, nothing's changed there. You know, Florida's, um, you know, recruiting him very hard. They can, they can only reach out to they, – they can only send him mail and stuff, and Jamie does a good job of reaching out himself. He can call the coaches, but the coaches can't call him. Uh, but Florida's obviously – they're still the leader. He told us that on Sunday, and he'll be on campus March 7th. So that'll be one to keep an eye on just considering how long Florida's been on top. Um, but, you know, Micah Morris is another one out of Georgia. And, you know, John Hevesy – has really been putting in the work here. Um, you know, I would say he's a top 100 offensive lineman, uh, um, you know, Southern Georgia. 
Um, he has a top five, top six, somewhere in that range. But I think the three schools are really monitored for him. Would probably be Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina. Uh, Florida got him on campus six times, I believe, in 2019, and Georgia has got him on campus just as much. And South Carolina is a school that's been there from day one. So he'll be on campus on March 7th. He's one of the nation's best offensive linemen. And that mutual interest is very high, but it's kind of similar uh, to last year's class. I'm trying to think, oh, it was like Kavius Walker when – I didn't think he was going to pick right. Auburn at the time, but it was kind of the same situation where he had such a good relationship with Florida, but Georgia was always right there and always doing a good job as well. So I think that one comes down to Florida and Georgia in the close battle, maybe give the dogs a slight edge. Um, but yeah, Florida's definitely in the running a lot. That's obviously only five or six kids um, as far as a group, but yeah, Florida's definitely in the short list for so many kids there. And you can definitely tell that, you know, the staff is really, I mean, you can definitely tell right now with a lot of kids, there's a whole different vibe at this time with th this time of year with this class compared to where the 2020 class was you know at this time last year in my opinion definitely definitely Corey bender from gators territory joining us right here on gators breakdown and Corey, you just kind of mentioned it there you just take a look at this 2021 class overall and, and where it stands right now coming in ranked third uh on rivals with 11 commits and one five star and tyreek sap seven four stars three three stars what do you like about the class so far yeah, I, the thing is what I like about the class, I think we're talking about before, it's just a different type of playmakers. I think with Trevante Rucker, he just kind of fills that need in the slot but can do so much more. But Brayshard Smith is kind of a similar player. You have a lot of those do-it-all kind of fleet-footed playmakers. Not the biggest guys, but the guys that can really kind of break you down in space. And I think that was important early on. You have some guys like that. Um, you got Carlos Del Rio. I mean, you got to love that gang of single caller who's been kind of sold on Florida for a while, you know, even last fall before he committed, you could tell he wanted to be at Florida, but you know, the staff had to kind of do their due diligence. You know, it's an important position to take. You just don't take anyone. And he camped in front of Florida and they loved what they saw. And he kind of put it all on the line and did what he had to do. Um, and obviously back in the trenches again, you got Tyreek Sapp, you know, five-star prospect, you know, Clemson, Alabama, Georgia, and others. I mean, they're really going after him. It's going to be, I'm not going to say it's going to be difficult to keep him in the class, but Florida's really has their work cut out for him. You know, they really got to keep recruiting him fairly hard and you know one prospect too Dave that I like quite a bit is uh Javante Gardner out of Orlando um I don't know if you've watched his film yet one of the newest offensive line additions in that class but he's about 6'5 about 275 um really good frame you know Ben I mean very fairly flexible too um one of those guys that's a high upside type of prospect where you know especially as he adds weight and refines his technique I think when he committed a lot of people were like who like who's this guy because Florida offered him last summer and his recruitment's been kind of fairly under the radar since, but you watch his film, you understand why, you know, Florida, well, John Hevesy and Florida really kind of took that next step with them. Um, so either way, you got a lot of needs in the class. I think as far as needs in the class, there's definitely a few of them. I think with safety, that's obviously one. I think last year's class, they did a good job. The, the, the crop of safeties they got were impressive, but you also have some prospects that are kind of raw in there as well. Um, you know, as far as, you know, you miss Avante and I think, you know, I'm predicting, you know, we're talking about before Mark Britt off record, but I, I think he goes to Ole Miss. And then, you know, Mordecai McDaniel, he has a ways to go as far as developing. Um, but I think safety's a need in that class. And Mario Harvey's obviously the top target there, uh, linebacker too. And um, also tight end too. I, I'm a big fan of John Odom, but obviously with the way the classes are going to be stacking up, you know, as far as you have Zipper beneath him and some other guys, I think getting a high profile tight end in this class would be huge. Yeah, you mentioned you know some of the, the areas that the, the class needs to hit hard. Uh, really agree with you about Harvey and looking really good uh, for right now. Uh, the Gators do, and, and looking at the state of Florida as well, Corey. You know the Gators really have a chance to add to the really really good defensive line class that they had last cycle. We mentioned a lot of these guys that were in Orlando this past weekend, but this is a, this is a chance for Florida with so many in-state guys to really nail home the defensive line and, and the trenches two classes in a row. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Leonard Taylor, he's the one that comes to mind right away um, out of Miami Palmetto. He's, he's been a strong Florida lean for a while. I, if you would have told me you thought Brayshard Smith would commit before Leonard Taylor about five, six months ago, I probably wouldn't have believed you. I thought <laughs> Leonard would have been in the class by now, but he's a kid, obviously, a blue-chip prospect. Um, would be a nice in-state addition along the defensive line. And uh, same with Savion Collins, his teammate. He's committed to Miami, but, you know, David Turner's done an outstanding job with him recruiting him. Um, and like you said, locking down this state as far as I want defensive line, it looks like this could be another year where they do that. And um, and obviously, I know Tamise, he's not from Florida per se, but he has ties to Florida. Several family members 
now with the IMG Academy. So yeah, a lot of these guys, when it's all said and done, like I said, um, you add SAP in the equation, you have a lot, you have a stellar class along the defensive line. Florida can keep it up and seal the deal with these guys. You mentioned the uh, Miami Palmetto High School down there. You know, a high school loaded in state where the Gators would love to get in for a few players there. Um, already commitment in Brashard Smith, the wide receiver. So many targets. You mentioned Leonard Taylor and J- uh, Jason Marshall, Corey Collier, a uh, defensive back, Savion Collins as well. Gators look to be in, in good shape. Do you think these guys could could feed off of each other? You know, already a, a commitment from Smith. You said, you know, maybe have to flip uh, Collins from Miami. But, you know, it, it, is – is the Gators maybe the one school that resonates with all these kids? Yeah, I definitely would say so. I think since day one, I mean, if you, I, I haven't seen much, obviously Florida State, there hasn't been much buzz there besides Corey Collier. I mean, he's a legacy kid, and there's been a lot of buzz with him just based off the connections he has there. But yeah, Florida's been the one school that's really struck a chord with all these kids as a whole. Um, and like you said, I mean, with Leonard Taylor, I, th- I predict him to be in Florida's classes as now. You already got Brayshard Smith. Um, the one is more the question mark, I would say. I mean, Sam Van College, you could put in that category considering he's committed to Miami. Yeah. But I think we all know how good of a job Florida has been recruiting him and how many times he visited during the season as well. Um, and like, I think with him, it's just all along with him is just getting his mother on campus. I know, you know, I've talked to Sam Van many times and his mother's a big Miami supporter. And, you know, he kind of does, he always told me, he's like, you know, I got to do what my mom wants to do type thing. And, you know, she plays a huge role in his decision. And the staff's been doing, that's been the main priority is getting, you know, his family up on campus now and then showing them what Florida has to offer. But I think Florida with all the rest of them and Jason Marshall too, he's one that's kind of a, more of a question mark. Florida is definitely very, very high on his list, but he's been, he hasn't really said much lately. He's been more well-reserved about his recruitment, but I think right now with Corey Collier, you know, you got Leonard Taylor, who's uh, considered a lean. Those are the three guys I think Florida has it today, probably has the best chance with. Um, I'm including Brayshard in that group too. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Corey Collier, Brayshard, Smith, and Leonard Taylor, those are the three I could definitely see in the class. Um, and the same with Savion Collins and Marshall. It's just those two have been more well-reserved. And like I said with Collins, it's about getting his family on campus and, you know, impressing them and showing them what the university has to offer. But Florida is the one school linked to all five where – they definitely would have the best shot if they grabbed all five. I think it definitely would be Florida. All right, got, of course, you mentioned got the quarterback early in the fold with this 2021 class with Carlos Del Rio. He's very vocal about recruiting his future teammates, and so far he's producing some good results. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So before even um, before he transferred schools recently, he's at Grayson High School. Um, but before that, he was at uh, McEachern in Georgia. And, you know, Chief Borders is one of his former teammates. Uh, those two are close and he's done a good job. And he's told us from day one, ever since he committed, that he wants to bring the most quality receivers with him to Florida. And he's been actively about that, too. And um, with Dejon Reynolds, he's more of an athlete, can kind of project to a few different positions. Uh, many believe he'll end up at receiver once all said and done. And you know, that's one of his new teammates. So he has one of his one of the commits in Florida's class is an old teammate, and now he has another one at Grayson, Dejon Reynolds. So, um, no, he's definitely been living up to that. He's been putting in the work. Um, as of right now, those are, there's not many notable names considering how receiver how receivers played out so far. A lot of the other targets are more out of state as far as what Florida is going after. But um, he's done a good job. He's been vocal. And uh, even when we – I put out an article recently, I think, saying how Florida had the top three class. And, he quoted me right away with a bunch of fire emojis saying this is just a start. So he's a fired up guy. Um, he's putting in the work on the recruiting trail and uh, these upcoming events to the junior days. That's when we'll really get to understand like who are the main, like kind of how Frazier's was last cycle. Um, really get to see who are the key recruiters in this class. And uh, so far, so good, man. He's been vocal and that's what you want out of your quarterback. Yeah, absolutely. That does take us to our next uh, topic here. As you said, March 7th, junior day. Seems to be the next big event on campus for the Gators. So many big names, and, and a lot of them we've already mentioned here. Um, of course, the Gators have 11 commits, and, and you know, are you know, really you know, making a move this cycle. Could this be an event on this you know March 7th weekend where Florida tries to push for some guys to to, to go ahead and make their move with spots already be you know being taken up with 11 commits? Uh, you know, if so, if so, who are some of the guys that can make an early pledge? Yeah, definitely, man. Yeah, so there's a lot of kids at this event who are leaning towards Florida. Um, one of the ones definitely, obviously, that we talked about before is Amari Harvey. Um, I think as of right now, Florida really made up a lot of ground with him during the last visit. And his mother, I, from what I told his mother and his family, were really just blown away a bit, blown away by the presentation as far as academics and everything. He's one I know Florida's really going to be trying to push to make that decision because I know they're right there. Um, you got Bryce Langston, who's another one where I think may just believe just – when is it going to be? It's not what school he's going to pick. Just when is he going to mm-hmm. make his decision? 
Um, you got Leonard Taylor, too. He's returned to campus. We just mentioned how big of a lean he is. Um, Desmond Watson told me he's 50-50 right now, um, you know, as far as that. And, yeah, you have other ones coming on campus, too. Like I said, you got Jaheim Singletary. I know we mentioned, you know, him announcing the spring. You have a lot of guys that have already publicly named Florida as the leader. It's just about pushing the right buttons, providing that comfort on the visit, and really just trying to leave no doubt in their mind. And, uh, yeah, there's a lot of those guys, too, on that list. And one other one to keep an eye on, too, is uh, Latrell Neville. He's a wide receiver out of Texas. Um, there's been a lot of buzz with him over the last two, three months, even though he hasn't visited um, and, you know, he's been signaling that he's going to get on campus. And from what I've from what I've heard, he's kind of told people that, you know, Florida's a school he would actually like to end up at. And they initially didn't make his top list of schools. But when I talked to him about a month or so ago, he said Florida was like right in the top two, top three range. And a lot of things have changed since. So he's an out of state kid. Um, like I said, I've heard a lot of buzz before the visit. And you would think now getting him on campus and he's another big body receiver at six, four um, would be a nice complimentary piece with Rucker and, you know, Brayshard Smith getting another big, big body receiver in the group. So those are probably the main ones to keep an eye on. And like I said, we have all the Palmetto kids on campus too. I just don't see them making decisions quite yet other than maybe Leonard Taylor. Got you there. So a couple of other thoughts here. If we move backwards uh, a little bit, a couple more other recruiting items and, um, you know, and some of these connect now so first of all what are your thoughts on florida hiring tim brewster and to and then to further extend that let's go ahead and connect the dot to the recruitment of zach evans uh brewster's taking part in his recruitment now and it, it really just looks like you know if florida gets evans on campus uh, in march then the gauges stand a great chance to to land him you never know with the twist and turns we've seen so far with that recruitment uh but you know what so far uh, are your thoughts uh initially on brewster it, what he's done, you know, basically in, in just a week so far and how it connects to Zach Evans. No, yeah, the buzz has been tremendous. Like I said, I think losing Larry Scott, Larry is a great guy. He's an outstanding recruiter. So everyone, he was one of the staff members when he initially left. It was like, man, you know, they got to fill that void. But, you know, getting Brewster, I think, obviously, was an outstanding hire. Um, like you noted, he's, he's now linked to Zachary Evans' recruitment. He has outstanding ties in the state of Texas. Um, and the buzz has been unreal. I mean, they've offered about, I think, in the – about five or six kids I've talked to in the 2021 class, and all of them have just been raving um, about you know his presence, especially in the state of Texas. They offered a pair of 2022 tight ends last week, and they both basically signaled to me that Florida. I mean, once they visit campus, Florida will likely be the team to beat, just based off their relationships with Brewster since they're recruiting him at North Carolina. Um, so the, the buzz has been great, and then obviously he's one of those guys that can really seal the deal. He's known for you know reeling in those top tier recruits and. If you're going to really Zachary Evans, who, like you said, twists and turns, it's been a roller coaster. This is the type of guy you kind of need in your corner as far as just kind of going out there on the battlefield for Florida and really trying to seal the deal. And, um, and I think now, like you said, getting into Evans recruitment specifically, I think even before Tim Bruce is hired, the past week or probably the past week and a half, two weeks, I've been hearing mostly all Florida buzz. Mm -hmm. I know they had an in-home visit, you know, back before the, uh, the sign period. And I think we all know it didn't go the best. And, you know, Florida kind of went their way and, and I was told shortly after that that Evans was calling Dan Mullen, like trying to kind of get back on board, um, trying to get back on the board. And, you know, Dan wasn't budging as much, but a lot has changed since then, just based off how everything went on sign day. And, you know, there's a need and and we don't know all the details. Obviously, there's a lot going on behind the scenes with this situation. But, yeah, it's been a lot of Florida buzz. And based off what I heard, you know, over the last two weeks that, you know, if he gets on campus, like you said, David Marsh, that, you know, the plan would be to enroll sometime in May. And that's if he gets on campus. So I think right now Florida's sitting in the best spot you can be at this point. I mean, like I said, it's been so many twists and turns. I mean, Tennessee, the Ole Miss, the Florida, the Georgia. I mean, like you said, nothing's going to be official till it's finally, you know, signed and sealed. But as of today, I think you have to like Florida's chances more than most just based off, you know, the vibe right now when I'm hearing with Tim Brewster and, you know, the chances of him getting on campus and, it's been a lot of buzz with him over the last two weeks. It's just nothing's going to be official till we really see it in paper. So um, Florida right now is, you know, they're in a good shape before Brewster came on board and now adding him, it just sweetens it up that much more. And he'll be one, obviously, to really monitor the next couple of weeks. Uh, Corey, I do wonder, you you know, you were in Orlando at, at a big football event this past weekend uh, with the Brewster hire. Is there, was, there, was there any talk of, you know, from players or, or coaches or fellow colleagues about uh, Brewster now being a Gator? No, there was some, not as much with a lot of these guys, just based off um, a lot of these kids. Yeah, not as much. I talked to a few of the kids, but it wasn't as much. A lot of the other ones I talked to are more of the recent offerees that have spoke with him. And I told, we talked to Jonathan Odom, too. 
who's already connected with him and he's been super stoked about the hire, but um, it's, it's been more with out of state prospects uh, more than 2022 class, as far as right now, and then obviously the Evans situation. Uh, but yeah, right now it's been more And another one that actually, now that you mentioned that one kid, I just definitely want to um, not leave out here as far as we're talking about needs in the 2021 class. And one kid right now, that's obviously a good one is Lewis Hansen. He's a top hundred prospect, one of the nation's elite tight ends for next year's class. He has family in Venice. Um, he's already in communication with Brewster, and now a visit is set for next month as well. So that's one of the kids, one of the nation's top tight ends for next year's class. And we mentioned how that's a priority, but you know he has family in Venice. Um, he was obviously he's been tracking Florida for most of his life, but you know Brewster and about four or five other staff members are recruiting him. And yeah, he's one that definitely raved about the hire. And here we are, what a week after him and I spoke. Now he has a visit set and. You know, and a lot of that has to do with Tim Bruce's presence. He's really put his foot on the accelerator in that recruitment. Um, but, yeah, he, he's one I definitely don't want to miss out when mentioning, you know, top-tier kids that Brewster's connected to. What type of tight end is he, Corey? More, uh, is he the Kyle Pitts receiver type? Is he a mix of, you know, Yeah, he's more, he's more receiver type, more in the 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six range, more uh, more fluid. Um, definitely, I mean, he's a decent blocker, but, yeah, he's definitely more advanced as a pass catcher. Um, definitely gets down the field well. Um, uh, can definitely create those mismatches. Has a good frame, definitely, to add another 15 to 25 pounds. So he's one of those guys, more of a high upside tight end um, with a good frame and um, definitely one, like you said, more of a pitch type. Um, not, but like I said, he definitely, definitely no knock on his blocking. He's more, he's well-rounded, but definitely more advanced and, you know, as a receiver. All right. And not too long before we uh, started the record of this episode, you released uh, an article uh, at Gators territory detailing Mark Britt's recruitment. We know he's going to make his decision uh, on February 20th. Uh, what can you share about where that stands? Yeah, so this is an interesting one. So I think a lot of us have kind of, I mean, it's been linked as far as, it's been a question as far as his academics, as far as if he can get in the Florida or not. And uh, based off, I was talking to a few sources over the past, or the, actually three different sources this afternoon, and all signaled to me that Ole Miss is a complete vibe right now. Um, I know Florida was hoping that he would push his decision back until April. Um, and they kind of the same situation with Leonard Manuel, because that's what his plan is to announce in April. But, you know, from what I was told, Britt wasn't really going to budge with that. He wants to announce this month. Um, and based off, I'm, I'm not going to say Florida split ways with them, but that's basically the way it's going to go for right now. I mean, as, it, bearing a surprise, I expect him to sign with Ole Miss. Um, like I said, I don't think Florida is willing to kind of drag in the April. And if he does sign in this month, drag in the April on all these ifs and if this, if he's going to qualify, if he's not, I think Florida is content with the class they have. And based off what I heard, yeah, I don't think yeah, Florida isn't expected to send him a, a, a letter of intent to sign. So as of right now, bearing a surprise, I expect him to sign with Ole Miss, but I've seen crazier things happen, but you know, those are from three reliable sources that I speak with quite often. And yeah, the vibe right now is completely Ole Miss. Yeah, if it's like Corey and I talked right before we come on here and a lot of the same stuff I was hearing as well. So uh, Gator fans wouldn't look forward uh, uh, on the on the 20th uh, on Thursday for a break to to announce for Florida. As Corey says, any anything's possible there in the world. Of hey, I've seen crazier things, but yeah, that's been like that's been the vibe, I think, across the board. Like you said, Dave, I think yeah, you said you're hearing the same thing. So, I mean. We'll, we'll track it. Like I said, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I mean, there could always be a change of heart. But, yeah, I think right now, I think the prediction for sure right now is, you know, old Miss for Mark Britt. All right. Let's do uh, – Corey, stay with me here, and we're going to move forward, move on to some uh, other topics here. That'll do it for recruiting and the uh, the big rivals camp in Orlando here. A couple of uh, topics kind of over, you know, late last week, over the weekend as well that we'll get into before we uh, call it quits on this episode. And that's, uh, uh, of course, Florida made the hire of Tim Brewster – uh, still not, you know, they still haven't put it out there officially yet, but uh, we we already know it. he's already tweeting all pro Gator stuff. So we know that's happening for sure. And it also looks like uh, a report from ESPN's Chris Lowe that Charlie Strong, uh, his name's been in the news, of course, the last couple of weeks uh, on the Florida end. And now Chris Lowe from ESPN and some Alabama folks I know as well are pretty confident on their end that Charlie Strong will accept the role for the Alabama Crimson Tide as an analyst and uh, try to let people know, uh, Corey, that this wasn't a done deal out there for Florida, no matter the reports that were coming out the last couple of weeks. Look, Charlie could be at Florida if he wants, uh, but it, you know it does seem he'll choose uh, Alabama for an off-field role. We all know the track record of uh, Nick Saban and, and basically his reclamation project of coaches. So maybe Strong sees an opportunity to, to get back to being a head coach better with Saban than, than, than Mullen. Of course, I'm sure money plays into it a little bit as well. Uh, maybe the history of uh, Jeremy Foley deciding to hire Will Muschamp over Charlie Strong. 
uh, back in the day, still eats at him. Who knows? Uh, but, you know, this wasn't a done deal for Florida. Still not a done deal to Bama, but that's where it's leaning. That's where the reports are, are reporting now from uh, ESPN and uh, some Bama, uh, Alabama people I know as well. But, you know, it does look like it's trending Alabama for now. And look, this is still for an analyst off the field role. You know, someone that will scout opponents, help game plan uh, you know, for upcoming opponents. You know, not much in the way of recruiting or, or you know, game day coaching. Still an important role, but not, you know, not really as much of an effect as an on-field coach or coordinator. No, absolutely. And I think you said best before. I mean, I think a lot of people put all their eggs in one basket thinking it was almost a done deal with this. And, um, you know, all along I was told, hey, you know, Florida hasn't received uh, an answer yet from Charlie. They're still waiting on Charlie. And and then there's the the reports I was hearing, too, that if Charlie did come on board, say if Todd did decide to retire after this year or whatever it may be, you know, if he decided to take another gig after a few years, that maybe Charlie could step in and be that DC eventually. So there's all these different stories going around of what could be and what would be, what would be his potential role, what would be his current role in Florida. But yeah, I think we've seen this a lot from Nick Saban. Like I said, he has the ability to kind of bring in some of these top tier coaches in these analyst roles, really kind of get back to the X's and O's of football. And, um, and like you said, money definitely plays a big factor in all this. And, we don't know exactly what Saban told him as far as what could be on the table after this season or whatnot. But, yeah, it was all along I was told, too. You know, Florida hasn't received a, a final answer from him yet. And I think May just assumed uh, before Alabama got involved that, you know, where else is he going to land? You know, Florida's already in talks with them and everything's looking good. We just got to wait on an answer. And as time went by and, you know, like you said, we, they never received the answer to that point. You kind of had started thinking a little bit then. It does. I mean, like I said, it, it definitely you would want him on the staff. I mean, he's a household name. He has a ties to Florida. I think many Florida fans, I mean, every year when there's a big <laughs> opening or something like that, you hear a lot of Charlie's name going around. But, yeah, it is what it is. I think it's obviously it's not a – it doesn't hurt Florida too much. Obviously, you would like to have him on the staff. But we've seen this from Saban before, and it really doesn't surprise me whatsoever. You can't really put all your eggs in one basket and things come there until it's finalized. And once you saw Alabama got involved and you saw the picture of him in the tie, yeah. you know, in Tuscaloosa doing it, you know, basically on campus, you kind of, I started shifting my attention elsewhere, kind of realizing, you know, this is probably what's going to happen. And, you know, here we are today and, you know, it's basically official at this point. Yeah. Right, and the last bit of item uh, over the weekend, uh, well, it came out on Monday here is the EFP, ESPN's ever so popular FPI, the football power index and, Kind of surprising. They they had the Gators at 11th. And you, know, you guys remember, I wasn't a big fan of ESPN's FPI this past season, uh, especially when the season ended. Uh, this is the same ranking that still had LSU ranked behind Ohio State and Clemson after LSU wins the national championship, beats Clemson in the college football title game. So uh, pretty ridiculous there. Look, I, I know it's a formula. Uh, it's a measure, and this is how they explain it, a measure of team shrink that is meant to be the best predictor of a team's performance going forward. For the rest of the season, the FBI represents how many points above or below average a team is. Projected results are based on 10,000 simulations of the rest of the season using FPI. So, of course, that would be the whole season uh, right now. Uh, results to date, there are none. And the remaining schedule. So, um, here are the rankings, if, um, you know, if, it, if it piques your interest here. Uh, 2020 preseason FBI rankings, Clemson, Ohio State. Okay, you're not going to complain there too much. Oklahoma at number three over Alabama at number four. That's probably where you can start questioning this a little bit. And yeah. then the big questions. Here we go. Penn State, number five. Wisconsin, number six. Texas, number seven. Texas A&M, number eight. Notre Dame, nine. Georgia, 10. And Florida, 11. LSU, 12. USC all the way up to 13th. Oregon, 14th. Auburn, 15th. So there's your top 15. Corey, man, I – I don't get it. As I said, I, I know it's a, it, I know it's a formula. I know it's something a, out there, uh, but something in this formula needs to be reworked because it makes no sense. <laughs> the top two makes sense, but after that it gets kind of sketchy. Of course, none of it matters. It, it, it's still a, a metric being used uh, by the biggest sports media out there. So it, it gets all kind of headlines and attention. And look, you know, we know Florida is going to be a really good team coming up in 2020, an easier schedule this coming year. So I have no clue how Florida is not ranked top 10 uh, in any metric being used with a combination of the team itself and the schedule. Really makes little sense for Florida to be ranked behind a, a good bit of those teams. No uh, sense. Yeah. Uh, and you go out there and look, you know, a lot of traditional media and, and the way too early rankings out there think much more highly of Florida 
And this is one where I think uh, the data is just not matching up, of course. But look, still have to go play the games. None of this matters, but it is a good uh, conversation piece, nonetheless. No, I think like you said, I think a lot of it's made for fans to kind of uh, kind of generate that chatter. And as far as my team's better than yours, or well, we have this guy returning. Look at the depth we have on this side of the ball. And like you said, I think it's more just for the conversation base. But like you said too, I think around five to eight is where I'm like kind of sitting there scratching my head as far as how they kind of came up with this exact order based off, like you said, what Florida's returning and based off of the schedule kind of mixed in with it. The fact that Florida's not, even with Georgia at 10 and Florida, yeah. 11, even those two schools, like I said, they should easily be in the top 10. And that's where once I started getting the five, six, seven range, I kind of like started scratching my head and I took a bite of my toast this morning um, mm. when I first saw it. And I was kind of like, man, this is kind of, I don't really understand it either, Dave. But yeah, I think the free, you can't really argue with the first four. And like you said, Oklahoma, Alabama, I mean, I would have put Alabama over Oklahoma for going into next season, but that's just me. And that's where it kind of, like you said, it kind of got me losing, not interest in, but I was like, ah, okay, here we go again. And then you just kind of go down and down. And yeah, as far as Florida easily, easily should easily be in that top 10 conversation. I, I'm not really too sure how they came up with that either. Yeah. I mean, look, Vegas probably isn't the best barometer either, but you put teams on a neutral field of Florida, Penn State, Florida, Wisconsin, Florida, Texas, Florida, Texas A&M, Florida, Notre Dame. They're probably going to be favoring all those. <laughs> and, and I grew up in Big Ten country, too, so it just shows I'm not biased, too. So I'm <laughs> kind of sitting and looking at that middle group, too. There's nothing against the Badgers or you know the Nittany Lions and stuff like that. But I just the fact that Florida's kind of mixing, knowing what Florida has coming back and the potential they have and just the upward – swing we have right now with the mo the momentum of the program i mean it's just kind of it's more laughable but yeah it is what it is i think most of it's just to kind of it's all this analytics and numbers they they simulate it all together and then you have a bunch of fan bases pointing at each other and arguing their points but yeah we'll we'll see how the season plays out and obviously it'll prove like i said the season will kind of reflect you know how this how accurate this truly was and as of right now i'm not too into it i don't buy it too much so we'll, we'll see how it plays out though yeah, I'm a big number analytics guy, but uh, that formula needs to be reworked. So. <laughs> 100%. All right, Corey, what you guys got coming up at Gators Territory? Of course, we were kind of counting down to that March 7th uh, junior day that the Gators are having, but uh, a lot of uh, you know recruiting recruiting never stops, as you know. Yeah, like, like we know before, I put out that piece on Mark Burt not too long ago. We're still rolling out a lot of these individual interviews. We'll have interviews with Des Desmond Watson here this afternoon, uh, Jaheim Singletary, individual one with him. All, basically, all the targets we listed, we have individual interviews for, all, interviews for most of those prospects, and those will be on the way today and tomorrow. Um, I'll be on the road. I'll be going down to Miami Palmetto here in the coming weeks to do some individual interviews with those guys. Um, like you said, recruiting never stops, and you know, to stay locked on the Gears territory. And we're always running out staying promos too, as well. So never lose track of that. And um, yeah, your one stop source for all you know for recruiting athletics. All right, that's Corey Bender from Gators Territory. You can follow him on Twitter at uh, Corey underscore Bender. Corey, man, I can't thank you enough for all the uh, recruiting insight here at the, uh, off of uh, a big Rivals camp uh, or Orlando weekend. No, thank you so much for having me on, Dave. All right. I'm the host of Gators Breakdown, David Waters. You can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SEC. Guys and girls out there, thanks for listening to this episode of Gators Breakdown.